You know, it's interesting what Tuesdays do in my life as I make my way to the office and open my Bible and begin planning the next week's lesson. We ended last week with this concept of God's love. And ultimately, how God exhibited his love through salvation. I look at our lives. And we do a lot of things over and over and over again. And I think we hear things over and over and over again. And I think over time, unfortunately, when we hear those things, Power is lost. Jesus breathed his last. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And he yielded up his spirit. We've read those things so many times. Do you remember the first time you read that? Do you remember the first time you realized and it hits you that Christ died for you. There's an interesting thing that's become a viral trend on the Internet. You can find them on YouTube. They're called reaction videos. And there is a reaction video. It's called Kids React. And what they do is, is they bring these kids in this room and they film them seeing something for the first time. This particular video was kids reacting to Adele's song, Hello. And it was interesting to hear these kids and watch these kids react for the first time seeing this song or maybe even hearing it. But there were some of the kids that, that had heard it before. And in fact, it was interesting as I was watching the video, you know, reaction is, my mom really likes this song, but I don't. Oh, this song's like on the radio every day. At one point, she's, you can kind of see it in this uh, picture of her uh, up on the top right. She's wearing like this fur coat, and one kid's looking at it, and you can see this puzzled look on his face, and he reacts in this way. He says, is she wearing a Chewbacca outfit? But, but they do these reaction videos for everything. Um, there'll, there'll be videos where they'll, uh, vocal coaches will react to this singer, and they'll, <clears throat> excuse me, dissect. <clears throat> Can I get my water? <clears throat> Something crawled inside my throat just now. Jed, you rubbed off on me. <clears throat> you did good. I'm struggling. They'll react to these vocal coaches will react to these singers and they'll pull out different things as they hear them. But it's interesting when you watch this reaction video, something will take place and you can watch their facial expression like, Wow. Photographers do this. You know, they'll, they'll get a picture of the groom seeing their bride in their wedding dress for the first time. I, we have a picture at our wedding. When I'm standing out front, I didn't see, you know, typical traditional idea. I didn't see Amanda before the ceremony. And she kind of started walking out of the room. And there's a picture of me with tears coming from my eyes as I see her for the first time. A reaction. When we think of our reaction to various things in this life, what do you see that you still react to? When you're waking up early in the morning and you're driving to work and you see a spectacular sunrise, how do you react to it? Do you pull the car over the side and get your phone out and take a picture? Send it to the people you love, maybe post it on Facebook? Look how beautiful God's work is this morning. You react that way. But because I think we talk about the death of Christ so often, as we should, and we remember his death every first day of the week, as we should, I think sometimes when we think about what we're doing when we're taking the Lord's Supper, when we read those verses, when we sing those songs, unfortunately, I myself can say I've become maybe numb in my reaction 
to what happened on that tree. Let me suggest something to you. Without what happened on the cross, we have no salvation. Without that blood that ran red, we don't have eternal life. How do you react to that? How do you react to the idea that Christ willingly went to the cross, breathed his last breath, was beaten, bled, mocked for you? How do you react to that? When is the last time you saw something and your jaw literally fell open? When is the last time? I remember September 11th, or yeah, September 11th, 2001. After the first plane hit the first World Trade Center, my mom came and got me up and I watched the second plane hit. I remember literally my jaw fell open. What just happened? I remember seeing footage of people falling out of the World Trade Centers and my jaw fell open. What just happened? If you read the scripture that was read this morning in Matthew chapter 27. Let's see whether Elijah will come to save him. And Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. What is your reaction? What is your reaction in that moment realizing what he's done? It's interesting as you read down and continue reading all the things that happened that day. If you have your Bibles open, I'm going to continue reading starting in verse 51. And behold, at the last breath of Christ, when he yielded up his spirit, the curtain of the temple was torn from top to bottom. The earth shook. The rocks were split. Tombs also were opened and many bodies of the saints who had fallen asleep were raised. And coming out of the tombs after his resurrection, they went into the holy city and appeared to many. And when the centurion, verse 54, and those who were with him, keeping watch over Jesus, saw the earthquake and what took place, they were filled with awe. When you look at the reactions that happened when Christ died on this cross, as we begin walking through the gospel of Christ, his death, his burial, and his resurrection, leading us to next Sunday when they come and they run to that tomb and that tomb is found empty. In order for someone to be buried, they must first die. On this day in Matthew 27, Christ died on this cross. And the witnesses were filled with awe. They had that draw dropping moment where they went, whoa. It's interesting when you think about the crucifixion. Crucifixions were common. In fact, Josephus records various times there was over 200 crucifixions happening at the same time. You can read other various historical documents and how they would line streets with crosses and crucify bad people, murderers, rapists, thieves. These were common events. So as we look at this today, we may sometimes get lost in the idea, of course, this was jaw-dropping. Of course, this was an awe-inspiring moment. But for these people, this would have been a common practice. They would have seen it before. In fact, they were the ones who asked for it. Crucify him. But they knew at that moment when they felt that earth shake, shook, when the clouds went or when the sky went dark, When those tombs were open, they knew at that moment this was different and they were in awe of what happened. They witnessed God's power at that moment. They witnessed God's design come to completion at that moment. They witnessed the plan of salvation fulfilled at that moment. They witnessed something that God had planned, that sacrifice that was going to replace the sacrifice of the blood of bulls and goats that was impossible to remove the sin of man from this point forward. 
They witnessed that. And when they witnessed it, they went, whoa, whoa, what just happened? Their jaws dropped. Their mouths were opened. Not only were they filled with awe, not only did they have this inspiration of this moment of, wow, we have this confession by the centurion. We just sang that song at the cross, Love Ran Red. In that song we sang in the chorus, I'm in all of you. We filled this room with that sound this morning. I'm in all of you. I'm in awe at the moment that you breathed your last breath for me. JV brought up the concept of all the memorials that have been placed for men and women who have died. You can go to uh, cemeteries like Arlington and see memorials for all the men and women who served in our armed forces and died. And people will walk there on that hallowed ground and be in awe. But I will tell you, Christ died for something far greater. Church, we need to be in awe of what he did. But maybe our awe has been quenched. Maybe our awe is not that excited anymore. Maybe we need to reignite in our life that awe. So when we sing praises to him, we mean it. So when we tell God about uh, people about God, we mean it because we can't help because we're so much in awe of what he did. So there, there's this centurion. Matthew, Mark, and Luke's account records this centurion. I can't tell you that it's the same man. I can't tell you that it's the same centurion recorded in, in all three. I, I think it probably is. But there would have been multiple centurions around for this event. But there's a statement that he makes that I want to focus on for a minute because I know it's maybe more popular than I even thought it was. But the statement that he makes is this. This is a Roman soldier, a commander in the Roman army. He maybe have been the one that was in charge of telling the men, drive a nail in his hand. Maybe he was the one who, who told the men to put the crown of thorns on his head. Maybe he was the one who grabbed the man to carry his cross. I don't know where he was, but this was who he was. And when Christ died, a confession was made. As he looked up at Christ on that cross. And the ESV records it this way. And with all, he said, truly, this was the Son of God. The discussion that's made is that maybe in the original language, the definite article is not there. I believe the point is still made that the centurion at that moment saw Christ as different than anybody else he's ever seen. This was a man who wasn't like the others that were crucified. This was a man, remember, in all of his suffering did not sin, did not revile. Yet even to the two thieves on the cross spoke with love and kindness. I think about the events that led up to Christ's crucifixion, the moments when he was being spit on and beaten. How many of us would just let it happen? It gets me riled up just hearing about it happening. No retaliation. When he's questioned, are you the one that's saying, it is I. I am he. I am who you say I am. All the while, people are noticing this one's different. When we read about the death of Christ on the cross, do we reinstate our confession to who he is? 
When we read about the death of Christ on the cross, do we in our minds, and maybe in our minds or maybe out loud, do we say, I confess that truly you are the Son of God. Does that make us go, I am God's child, fellow heirs with Christ, and he died for me? How do we reignite that awe? How does that awe cause us to action? Guys, most of us have heard this multiple times in our life, and I will tell you it's very easy to become complacent. It's very easy just to sit here on Sunday morning and sing the songs and be part of a church body and fellowship and, and listen to scripture. But guys, Christ died for you. Hear what I'm saying. That should change us. Like it did the witnesses that were filled with awe. Like the centurion who maybe pledged his allegiance to the Roman army, to the Roman emperors. Yet at that moment, he says, truly, this is the son of God. Truly, this man is from God. Truly, this man is different. If we do say that the centurion in Matthew is the same as the centurion in Luke, Luke expounds on this idea, and he says this. The centurion, along with all the people, it says, praised God, or literally glorified God. And in Luke, the centurion says, surely, truly, this man was innocent. But they praised God in doing that. I believe from that study that when the centurion made that confession in Matthew, if it is the same centurion in Luke, the centurion did confess that Jesus Christ was the Son of God. It was him. And at that moment, he says, and we messed up. And we blew it. We made the mistake. This was him. He's an innocent man, and we killed him. Not only was this confession made, but according to Luke chapter 23, in the reference that I just gave in verse 47, when Christ died on the cross, God was glorified, praised. Glory is literally to give weight to, to see the significance of it. This is a significant thing that just happened. Do we believe that? Do we believe when we read about Christ's death on the cross, this is a significant thing that's happened? It's given weight to. It's the moment in our life that we needed because without it, I can't be saved of my sins. God was praised. God was glorified. It's interesting when you think about back through Luke, the times that other times that this phrase was given, the same exact phraseology was given in Luke chapter 13 and verse 13. When Christ healed the, healed the disabled woman who couldn't stand up straight, he healed her. Once he healed her, the same statement was made. God was glorified. Did, did you just see the power of God? Wow. This is beyond a simple thank you. When's the last time you saw something that you went, God is awesome? Think about those times in your life. God is awesome. Maybe somebody has overcome a sickness. And you get the phone call that says, man, they went back, they had these tests, and it came back clear. The doctors don't know why or how, and you're saying, God is awesome. And in that moment, you broke down in tears, and you thanked God because God is awesome. Maybe holding your newborn baby for the first time, and you look down in those eyes that look just like yours. And that nose that looks just like yours. 
and those lips that look just like her mama's. And in that perfection, in that moment, something that, that God intricately wove together in the womb, you saw God. And you said, God is awesome. Those moments in your life where you're studying with somebody about Christ, about the gospel, about the death, the burial, and resurrection, explain to them the, 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 the death of sin. And that moment that they get it, that that light bulb goes off and they see the love of God. They realize who they have in Christ and they submit their life to Christ as king. And you say, God is awesome. We sing songs, we will glorify the king of kings. I don't know how we can sing that song in a mundane way. I don't know how we can't jump up, raise our hands, lift our voices in God and say, you are awesome. But we hear it every day, don't we? And maybe it's become something we take for granted. When they felt that earth shake and when they saw those rocks split and when they saw those tombs open, they were filled with awe. The centurion confessed, and God was glorified in that moment. But that's not the last thing that happened. Something else takes place that I believe lends itself to our best application today. People, the witnesses, the crowds were changed. I want you to understand something when you think about the crowd that witnessed the death of Christ. This was a crowd of people who not too long ago were yelling, crucify, crucify him. This was the crowd of people who decided to let other men go in order to crucify him. <clears throat> this was the, the crowd of people that stood by and watched him being beaten. You ever witnessed somebody being beaten? Probably most of us not. But we've all probably seen a movie and it's taken place. You know the emotional attachment that happens when, when somebody you have become to endure and like in a movie becomes getting beaten? Just get up! Get up! Somebody go help him! Shoot him! Some of you are laughing because you know exactly what I'm talking about. This was the same crowd of people who stood there and watched our Lord be beaten. Not only did they not help him, but they cheered it on. Yeah! Give him the cat of nine tails one more time. Press harder on that crown of thorns. Look at him. Look at the blood flowing down his face. These were those people. Turn over with me to Luke 23. Verse 44, it says, It was about the sixth hour, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth. While the sun's light failed, the curtain of the temple was torn in two. Then Jesus, calling out with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. What's your reaction? What's your reaction? And having said this, he breathed his last. And when the centurion saw what had taken place, he praised God, saying, certainly this man was innocent. And all the crowds who had assembled for this spectacle, when they saw what had taken place, returned home, beating their breasts. <laughs> what does that mean? Anybody ever looked that up for? What does it mean they were beating their breasts? You know, you think of Tarzan. I'm not going to do the, the sound. King Kong even. In Jewish custom, even in Oriental custom, this beating of the breast signified mourning, grief, sorrow, anguish. Listen to the last one. Guilt. 
If you have an NIV that you use, the footnote down there talks about the guilt affiliated with the beating of the breast. This, you understand what it says? The crowd was changed. They went from yelling, crucify him, crucify him, to walking away going, uh-oh. But we see this come to fruition, don't we, somewhere else. Remember that sermon in Acts chapter 2? Uh, we probably could believe that maybe some of the people who witnessed the death of Christ maybe would have even been there. And Peter and the other apostles preached this lesson about how you just crucified Christ. That's what the sermon was about. This man, Jesus, he was the son of God, and you just killed him. And what does it say in verse 37 of Acts chapter 2? The text says, and they were cut to their hearts. And they asked, what must we do? They were changed. They realized at this moment, when Christ breathed his last, when he yielded up his spirit, they changed. Literally, it was a life-changing moment for them. It was a paradigm shift. It shifted their thinking to how they believed. Does the death of Christ change you? I know. I know what it's like to be asked a question at the church building in a Bible class. I know. You hear the question, does the death of Christ change you? In this setting, we say, yes. I'm going to ask you again. Does the death of Christ change change you? Do we live like it? If the death of Christ changes me, I can no longer live in sin. Romans chapter 6 and verse 4 lends itself to what happens here. As Paul is explaining to them the trouble and the problem of sin, as he previously in Romans chapter 3 and verse 23 explained to them that we all have this sin, we all have this problem. But Paul said, just as Christ died and was buried, you too must also die to sin and be buried in the watery grave of baptism. You see, if the death of Christ changes us, we die to sin. It should provoke this, this mental shift in our mind to say, no longer can I do those things anymore, willingly. I'm not talking about those things we're going to continually struggle with, and we will. That's why the grace is so important. That's the point he's really trying to make in Acts chapter or Romans chapter 5 into chapter 6. We need that grace, but we must die to that sin. It can no longer rule in our life. And we look at our life and we say, sin can no longer rule in my life because when Christ died on the cross, I was changed. My thoughts changed. My appreciation changed. My love for God changed. My realization that God loves me so much that he gave his son to die for me was truly and fully realized when I learned that Christ died on the cross for me. And from this day forward, I will live different. I will live changed. Because just like those witnesses, just like that crowd, when they felt that earth shake, when they saw those stones split in two, when they saw those dead people come out of those, those tombs, when they heard that the temple curtain was torn from top to bottom, they left, beating their chests with guilt, anguish, sorrow, 
Because right then at that moment, they didn't have the rest of the story. They didn't have the rest of the story. You know what the difference between those people who left beating their chest was that day was? And us? Yeah, we have the rest of the story. We knew that he was buried in that tomb. We knew that they sealed that tomb so nobody could steal his body and fake a resurrection. But with my God, no resurrection had to be faked because the same God who sent his son to die on the cross for my sins, the same God that shook the earth and split those tombs, is the same God who rolled back that stone and on that third day emptied that tomb. And our lives are changed because Christ died on the cross because that blood was shed. I hope, I hope, I hope this week, I hope this week we can remember the death of Christ and go, you know what? He did it for me. I'm going to walk a little taller, smile a little bigger, worry a little less, and praise God even more because Christ died for me. And because of his death, I have eternal life waiting for me as a son of God. What is your reaction this morning? I hope maybe there are some who are looking at their lives saying, maybe I had not been living like I understand Christ died for me. Maybe there are some this morning that are asking the same question in Acts chapter 2. What do we do now? If I have this sin in my life, how do I rid myself of it? How do I change? How do I repent? How do I move forward? How am I buried to rise, to walk in this newness of life? Maybe that's where you're at. Maybe those are the questions that flood your mind when you think about and when you hear these words. Those questions can be easily answered by God's word. Let's answer them. Let's study them. Let's walk through the scripture. I don't want that day, some great day, when Christ comes back. I don't want anybody in this room to at that moment go, oops. Now is your opportunity. Now is your opportunity to realize the sin in your life, to die to that sin to be buried with him in the waters of baptism and to rise up out of that watery grave for the forgiveness of sins, for that gift of the Holy Spirit and eternal life. If that meets your need this morning, now's the time while we stand and sing the song that's been selected.